Good morning. I don't know about you, but when I was first con contemplated the idea of raising the next generation, the first thing I thought about were the generations that raised me and my generation, which inevitably, in my case, led me back to thinking about my maternal grandmother. One of my all-time favorite people, she really gave me many gifts, not the least of which was my own mother, which resulted in me being here today. But one of her, my favorite gifts is one she gave me inadvertently, and that was the decency to be born in the year 1900. She lived to be 99 and died in the year 1999. And so she embodies the average person's perspective for me of the entire 20th century. And really, when you think about what happened in her lifetime, it's extraordinary. She was born when people had not yet flown in an airplane. But by the time she's in her 60s, we've landed people on the moon. When she was a teenager and in her early 20s, there was no television to come home to because it wasn't yet invented. And yet, later in life, we not only had cable TV and color TV, but we had the World Wide Web to surf. And of course, most of the people on the planet did not have a telephone in their home when she was born. And yet, by the time she's died, we were well underway in the process of putting a phone in everybody's pocket on the planet. What an extraordinary change in the material existence of humankind in the space of one person's lifetime. I think that's really fascinating, and it really gives us a human sense of understanding just how powerful that change was. And that the child born in the year 2000 lives in a very different kind of world than my grandmother did when she was born in 1900. Not the least of which is there's not horse dew in the middle of the street when we walk by, and that is an improvement, I think. Now, what my grandmother probably didn't contemplate is around the time she was born and across the course of the century, a group of mathematicians and physicists and theorists developed what evolved into quantum mechanics. And it was a movement from the relatively simple understanding of the physics of the universe embodied in Newtonian physics to this more complex notion called quantum mechanics that enabled most of the inventions that made those material changes across my grandmother's lifespan. That the computer, space travel, indeed the smartphone, would not have been invented without the more complex understanding of the physical world that we get from quantum mechanics compared to Newtonian physics. It's not that Newtonian physics was wrong, it just wasn't up to the task of creating those elements, that technology that so changed our existence today, that indeed allows TED Talks to even happen. For that child born in 2000, we have another such revolution brewing. We are able to move from the relatively simple understanding of human communication to one that I label communication complex. Think about how most people consider the notion of communication. It starts with some kind of cognition in your head, whether you have hair or not. <laughs> we package it in some kind of wording, and then we transmit it by our voice and nonverbal to the next person who then takes it in, unpackages it in their head, whether they have hair or not. And then, if we have true fidelity, they will have mutual understanding and everything will work. That's elegant in its simplicity, the same as Newtonian physics was elegant in its simplicity. It's not that it's wrong, it's just not adequate to produce the kinds of changes that can improve the relational lives, indeed our very biological lives, in the 21st century. And this is the gift for raising the next generation. What we have learned from neuroscientists, social scientists, and communication theorists in the last couple of decades and what will continue to evolve is that communication is rather something more complex than that simplistic notion of transmission. For example, a group of neuroscientists recently exclaimed in an article that cognition doesn't materialize here like we all think, it materializes or evolves out of interpersonal space, between us and what we do, not in us. That's a profound shift in our understanding. 
In fact, what we find from some research is that the way we talk with each other shapes and frames and reshapes our brain structure and indeed our whole biology throughout our lifespan. That how that mother talks to her child or how that father talks to his child literally shapes the biological functioning of that kid. That how we talk with our partners not only is the quality of our relationship, but indeed it's our physiology. And so if we want to contemplate the idea of creating better individuals and the idea of creating better communities and, and better relationships within those, we have to recognize that communication is rather more complicated than the simple transmission of information, that in fact it helps create and structure our very physical evidence, essence. There was a report on the Today Show a few years ago that suggested that the way couples argue could predict heart attacks. In one of my more perverse thoughts, I thought, huh, so if you want to kill off your spouse and not get caught, <laughs> think about how to argue with them to do that. Now, aside from that kind of perversity, what it also recognizes is, is that how we talk with each other matters in terms of our own help. Communication theorists also tell us that where we are situated then in those patterns of interaction affects our individual, relational, and community well-being. Or put another way, our physical, mental, and social well-being, which are three elements at the heart of the WHO definition of health. And it's not just the absence of inferment, but actually celebrating the robust quality of that health in individuals, relationships, and communities. When you think of communication in that more complex way, it seems to me that you would want to know more and that you would want to create the kinds of relational or human development that corresponds with the kind of technological development that we created in the last century. Indeed, without quantum mechanics, think about how life would be different. You would have had to ride a horse here today to listen to us without the internet. Well, actually, none of that would have happened. Life would have been different. Well, think about the child born in the year 2000. Think about raising the next generation. We can teach communication skills that are not simply about the transfer of information, not simply about giving a great public speech, but about building better brains, creating more functional bodies, creating a different circumstance in which we live. So we can create healthier people, physically healthier people, mentally healthier people. We can create better relationships. Think about the billions of dollars invested in self-help books, seminars, and other efforts to try to have better relationships with our family, with our friends, with our intimate other. And yet, oftentimes we come up wanting, and it's because we start with that essence of communication simple. But when we go to communication complex, and we recognize that what's going on is between us, then we can work at it and approach it in different ways. And we have different tools and different ideas about how to do that. For example, one of the gifts that freedom of speech gives us is that we can say pretty much whatever we want. But of course, everybody always tags that with, yes, but there's consequences to that. And there we begin to think about that interplay. But if we go deeper and say that how we talk and what we say and what people say to us and how we respond back, how does that create our sense of identity? How does that create our level of anxiety? How does that create our level of depression? How does that create our sense of connectedness and loving and caring with other people? Do I want to change the way I talk and change the quality of that relationship? When we begin to start with those questions, rather than starting with those statements, then we're able to make better individuals. And we're, better, we're able to better make relationships. And indeed, as we do that, 
we create better communities. In public health, in an individual health, and in family health, we can raise the next generation in a much better way in the same way my grandmother's generation was raised in a much different material way. So, we cannot explain all of the factors of communication complex in one short talk, but what I hope we can do is encourage you to consider the idea that communication simple isn't up to the task of raising a better next generation. That in fact, communication simple isn't even up to the task of helping you live out the rest of your life, whether you're 10, 20, 50, 70 years old. That communication complex tells us, based upon a lot of scientific research, based upon a lot of theory, and a lot of observation, that we can change across our lifespan, we can have better lives, we can create better children, we can create better relationships, we can educate better, and we have all of those possibilities. Now, of course, quantum mechanics also gave us nuclear weapons. Some might argue that a nuclear blast isn't good for our health. And so as we learn communication complex, remember how people argue with you might cause a heart attack. <laughs> On the other hand, how people argue or engage in conflict with you might actually make you feel richer, healthier, strengthen your immune system, and make you feel more loved. I think my grandmother would have valued that at least as much as her color television. <laughs> and certainly I do, and certainly I hope all of you do. So communication complex, I hit, think, is our gift to the next generation. Thank you.